Cathy, there are 222 rooms on this barge below me. And as you mentioned, from next week, the first 50 asylum seekers, all single men aged between 18 and 65, will be housed here as part of a phase scheme. They won't be detained. There will be uh, onboard catering, basic primary health care offered, and extra funding will be provided to the local council, police and NHS. But there has been considerable opposition to this. The local council, among many others, wanted to stop it, but was advised that legal action wouldn't succeed. So for the Home Office, this marks perhaps an important and highly symbolic moment in the context of its immigration policy. But there are other legal challenges, of course, ongoing to elements of that strategy, not least the bid to send some asylum seekers to Rwanda. They're doing absolutely nothing and they want you to blame the refugees. The refugees aren't here. That's right. Yeah. And Portland is poor. So that's yes. what I'm saying. And this government, what, this Tory wrong. government, is trying to get you there to blame. There are people who have to use food banks. The same boat. Yeah. They're that's using right. food banks. They're in bed that's and right. breakfast with children for yeah. a year. Yeah. Who do you yeah. think is going to get on the house in this first? I think. Can I ask? Yeah. Of what? Do we know that? And so it continued for a short while in Portland this morning, within an hour of the Bibby Stockholm's arrival on the island. Lots of fear! Lots of fear! Some had been here at first light when in the distance, beyond this section of the Jurassic coast, it appeared. A hulking great floating accommodation block from perhaps the brutalist school of maritime architecture. A barge the length of a football pitch, soon to house up to 500 asylum seekers, heading for the shelter of Weymouth Bay, but utterly exposed to the political storm it will surely have to weather. As soon as it was announced that this barge would be destined for Portland, it has been engulfed in controversy. It was due here last month. It's finally made it to another chorus of objections. And tucked away in Portland Harbour, it may soon be. But for many, no doubt, this will be a totemic, divisive image in the ongoing debate over the UK government's approach to immigration and asylum. This barge was designed for 200-odd people. It's been converted to accommodate 500 in uh, accommodation which is little bigger than a car parking space. This is not the way that refugees should be treated. Refugees are people who have escaped from wars, invasions and crises. They have a right to apply, apply freely for asylum and to be treated with respect. And this barge is not the way to do it. Yet the imagery may well suit a government pledging deterrence in its bid to stop the boats as overnight its illegal migration bill cleared key hurdles in the House of Lords. Now set to become law, it will place a legal duty on the Home Secretary to detain and remove anyone entering the UK illegally. And now they have a barge, a cheaper alternative, they claim, to housing asylum seekers in hotels. What would be cheaper would be to process their asylum a lot quicker. Why is it taking years for people? Some people wait years for their asylum to be processed. Why? There has been widespread resistance locally to this barge, from the Conservative-run Dorset Council to the groups gathered here. Stand up to racism on one side, no to the barge on the other, who remain frustrated, they say, that concerns over how this barge may impact the island could be deemed racist. There are 13,562 people on the island. We're a small rural community. How can we absorb 500 anybodies? The problem is we can't even help our own. So how can we help others? And Weymouth and Portland just haven't got the infrastructure for it. We really haven't. There'll be extra Home Office funding reportedly to support the council here. One Whitehall minister today said such local concerns were understood. Which is precisely why we've got the illegal migration bill, which is exactly why we're taking action with Rwanda, which is exactly why we have a new deal with the French government to stop this trade in human life across the channel. If we break the back of these people traffickers and we stop the boats, which is the prime minister's number one priority, then we will no longer have to be reliant on communities around the UK hosting so many people who come to this country illegally. Soon dozens, then likely hundreds, seeking asylum in the UK will find themselves aboard the Bibby Stockholm, with all the political scrutiny that it now brings. 
Well, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has mourned the loss of Britain's tradition of providing refuge to those in need. Let's talk more about this with Vicky Tennant, who's the UNHCR's representative to the UK. Uh, the UNHCR says that the UK is potentially in breach of international law here. Can you set out why you're concerned and why the UK might be in breach of the law? Well, indeed. I mean, the bill effectively extinguishes the right of people coming here in search of refuge and protection to, to seek asylum. Um, and that's certainly a breach of the, the Refugee Convention, um, regardless of how compelling their claims are, regardless of how strong their case is for refugee status, they simply won't have the opportunity to have that claim heard. And we're, we're very concerned about that. We know that many of those coming across the channel, for example, come from countries that are affected by war and persecution. Um, they're of profiles that would typically attract quite a high grant rate in terms of grants of asylum and protection in the UK. So the people who are going to be affected are indeed those who really are most in need. Um, and that's something we're right. very concerned about. Well, did it cut any ice that the government did make concessions, for example, on the detention of unaccompanied children and, indeed, pregnant women? Was that insufficient? Certainly the concessions are positive, um, but they don't go to the heart of the bill, which is really about closing down access to, to, to asylum, access to protection. So no matter right. who you are, if you arrive in the country irregularly, having passed through a country where you didn't face persecution, then your claim will simply not be heard and the government will be under a duty to try to remove you to another country. And if it's not able to do so, you'll end up in limbo in the UK indefinitely, which is not good news for anybody. The Home Secretary says that, that claims that the bill breaches the Refugee Convention are fatuous and that the Convention obliges parties to provide protection, but it doesn't require that this protection be in the UK. Has she got her law wrong? Well, we've been very clear from the outset that it is our view as the UN agency um, charged with responsibility for supervising the Refugee Convention, that's written into the Refugee Convention. We've been very clear that it's our assessment that it breaches international law. Now, it is not necessary for every claim for asylum to be heard in this country, and indeed it is legitimate, and there have been arrangements whereby asylum seekers can be um, sent to other countries to, to have their claims heard. But that needs to be done within a framework of legal safeguards and within a frame of sharing responsibility for for refugees. So uh, right. an arrangement... And that's that, not there yet under this current that's bill that's certainly just not. Been I mean, an example of where that has been in place is the, the, the Common European Asylum System, of which uh, the UK was part of, the Dublin Regulation, which allowed transfers of asylum seekers to other European countries. Um, where there was a clear legal framework in place and where it was clear that asylum claims right. uh, would be heard. But simply so sending all asylum seekers away from the UK, expecting other countries to hear their claims, is not in line with the spirit or the, or the letter of the Refugee Convention. Right. So should the UK face sanctions, in your view? And what should they be? Well, the, 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 the impact of this, there are no formal sanctions. And of course, we as a UN agency and as the UN agency responsible for refugees, we will continue to work with and to, 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 to be in dialogue with the, the UK on this legislation. Um, but the impact is really on the refugee protection system as a whole. We know that the majority of refugees are in countries neighboring, in their, own, neighboring their own. Uh, developing countries, middle-income countries, and of course they take the vast majority of the world's refugees. So the signal that this uh, act, this, this legislation, sends to those countries um, is of course a very, very damaging one. These are the countries mm. that keep their borders open and welcome the, the vast majority of the world's refugees. So by stepping away from, from that system of international cooperation, we think that this is really very damaging um, in terms of the refugee protection system as a whole. Right. Vicky Tennant, thank you very much for joining us.